Discussing Miyazaki's lore is always a trip, especially when you're trying to do it at three in the morning and you keep messing up. I'm going to actually just do this off of a script and re-record the video that I tried to record with y'all last night. <laughs> so this is take two, welcome. Um, but when I was starting out uh, dissecting Miyazaki's lore, I would oftentimes categorize and bucket certain item descriptions based on what they were affiliated with. And I know that Vati does this too. He takes it a step further and he'll actually double check the Japanese translations with Loki. And this is super awesome because he can catch any inconsistencies with mistranslations. And I find that super important. But there's this objective uh, kind of like organization of all the concepts and you can create like a little timeline, a little map to figure out what the heck is going on. And this is super helpful, but it does leave a lot of blank spaces um, in the timelines, a lot of big ass gaps <laughs> between certain events. There's also, you know, a lot of metaphysical concepts or abstract things that are a little bit fuzzy. And so what I like to do is I'll take it a step further and I'll look at the historical and architectural references to figure out what culture I'm looking at. And then from there, I'll look at all the different religions and spirituality and like philosophical movements that are happening in that culture around that time period. And this is really helpful for me for understanding what they're going through on a like philosophical or spiritual level, because a lot of the Elden Ring has to do with metaphysical spiritual concepts. So let's fucking back it up. Let's rewind. The best thing that we can do in order to understand Miyazaki's like thesis or just like overall theme of his game is by checking out his interviews and understanding the man himself. Obviously, we've talked about him before. He went to Keio University. He has a degree in social sciences. He is a really big Western literature fan. He loves Magic the Gathering. He loves tabletop games. He loves a lot of things, and he actually wasn't allowed to play video games until much later in his life around college. So he's more of a literature, mythology, spirituality boy instead of a video gamer, which is cool. Um, I I love this. I love this about him because it, he, he definitely um, stresses the importance of literature in his books and spirituality and mythology. I love that. And then we have George R. R. Martin, who typically likes to focus on history. He... Uh, will use in his western um, his western fantasy books he'll use real life historical events to talk about um, the framework of a particular conflict during a time period and um, you know get into the drama of it all <laughs> so Game of Thrones A Song of Ice and Fire specifically was based off of War of Roses which was a war between a bunch of different families that believed that their house deserved the throne at the time so this leads to a very interesting conflict within history, and it's very human. It's a very human conflict, and I think that that's why parts of these series really resonate with people, because even though the characters aren't necessarily the most likable, they have very human elements that I think a lot of us can relate to, or we can find ourselves caring about them in some way. It's the drama. It's the drama of it all. So um, the reason why I like to look into creators and... Um, you know, their other works and their interests, their hobbies, is because there are a lot of creators out there, like directors or authors or even visual artists, who don't like to talk about the meaning of their works for a bunch of different reasons. There are some artists or directors who won't talk about their work because they want the um, viewer to go on their own journey. They want the viewer to go through, like, this journey of spiritual enlightenment or... Uh, personal enlightenment. They want you to do research. They want you to reflect on the content of their story and have a little, have a little bit of a spiritual awakening. Have a little bit of a, a moment of relation to the author. But in Miyazaki's case, it seems that part of it has to do with the gaming industry as a whole and just delivering certain products because there's a lot of constraints when it comes to writing a story for a product that, um, in which the main focus might not even be the story. So say you're working for a company and you're producing a game, but the company doesn't really care if the story makes sense. They care more about delivering on a functional working game that is hard and that will sell like a pretty decent amount. <laughs> so if you have a really complex world and you have a lot of complex ideas that are requiring a lot of resources and money to create, you might need to cut some of that content and maybe leave it for future DLCs 
Some creators like Yoko Taro will create stage plays <laughs> or companion novels or manga to like help illustrate some of the happenings in the game. Um, for Miyazaki, he typically will put the rest of his ideas in DLC, which we'll see later. We typically like to visit the past and see the buildup of the climax of the present day conflict in the games. Um, but he says, first of all, yes, there's a perfect storyline in my head. However, I have no intention at all of enforcing that storyline to players out there. Only those storyline elements that actually make it into the game are something I need to force players to accept as a base for building up their own interpretations of the world. There will be no official statements made about the true story of the game. And while he doesn't plan on ever telling us what he means, I want to try to understand. I want to try to understand him. And even if I'm wrong, I at least want to do the due diligence of researching his interests, hobbies, education, and overall things that he likes to visit in his other pieces of work. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> so anyway, because of the barrier, I like to look for clues. Um, and specifically in regard to like abstract things like the Elden Ring itself and the mechanics of these, this metaphysical holy object, um, I wanted to look at interviews that described it. Because like Miyazaki said, while a lot of his ideas don't make it into the final point of the game, he does like to um, flesh out the foundations of the world for us. And it seemed like um, the Elden Ring didn't get fully fleshed out in the game. We're likely going to revisit some of the happenings regarding the ring in the past, but he does have an interview and so does George R. R. Martin that gives us a little bit more insight into what the rings actually are. So he says, first of all, or sorry, he says the ring that you're looking at in the logo Oh, sorry, the rings that you're looking at in the logo are not so much a representation of those factions, as you put it, but more a representation of the law of the world, the rules and the order. This golden order is something that the Elden Ring may have once represented, but not directly. It's more about how you apply those rules and how you enforce them on the physical world and what effects they have on it. It's more the influence of these demigods that existed a long time before and how they applied these concepts of order and discipline. That's what's being represented by the Elden Ring and these overlapping intersecting rings. It gets a little bit more complicated than that, but I'll leave it there for now. And then George R. R. Martin was interviewed about his involvement in the game, during which he gives us some insight into the history of the world, his uh, writing, like what he did for the video game series. And he also talks a little bit about the Great Runes. He says, From Software contacted me a number of years ago and they wanted me to do this video game and they wanted a world build, which I've been doing for quite a while and I like doing it. But they made it clear that Elden Ring was going to take place in the present of their game universe. What they wanted me to write was what happened 5,000 years before that that totally screwed up the world so that the present was really messed up. So I went back and wrote a story of what happened 5,000 years before the current game, who all the characters were, and who all was killing each other and what powers they had. They had these runes that were the center of the game, and the runes got split into many pieces, and that's what screwed up the world. So back to the ring. For the Elden Ring's case, we don't have much evidence to explain their properties. In fact, I don't trust the narrator who's even talking about outer gods in a lot of the item descriptions because, um, as we know with the aspects of the Crucible, the attitude about certain groups have changed during the course of the history's game or the game's history. So, for example, aspects of the Crucible used to be considered holy, but they're now disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. The information that we know about the Elden Ring objectively is that it has to do with stars. It was said that long ago the Greater Will sent, sent a golden star bearing a beast to the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring. If the stars command our fates, then amber-hued stars must command the fate of the gods. Such is the belief that inspired the use of these shards to prepare a most special drought. This tie-in of our fate being dictated by stars isn't a new concept in storytelling. In fact, it's a really old thing in early history, and it was an old attempt at understanding uh, early astro astronomy, but it definitely took the shape of astrology. It was a pseudoscience, like a lot of the early sciences before they had the technology to fully explain what was going on. But Chaldean astrologers came from Neo-Babylon, and they established a study based on planets, metal affin affinities, numerology, and their understanding of the daily calendar and time, known as the Chaldean Order. Each metal, planet, or god has influence over different concepts. Early astrologies and horoscopes were based on this order, and these concepts were used in other works of fiction like 
in Sword and Sorceries, the Glorantha, which depicts these outer gods warring for control or influence over an empire. A neat reference to this um, in Elden Ring specifically is that there are Mesopotamian ruins present in the Elden Ring universe, which is something that I talked about in one of my history videos. Any of the Palace of Uld uh, obelisks have the cuneiform language present on them, and those are all located down in the Undercities. Um, some of the cuneiform can be found above ground, and some of the like statues of the old wizened man <laughs> exist exist above ground too, but I already talked about those in another video, so please check out that video if you want more on Mesopotamia and a lot of the early Western history. Um, but starlight is the light that's held in these stars, and it's an ingredient used in droughts. Stars or meteorite stones and crystals can also hold souls, or in this case, runes. Um, when we kill enemies, we get their runes. Remembrances are just a series of runes. It's effectively written language that allows us to remember the fallen, and that's what runes kind of symbolize in a metaphysical concept. So um, a lot of the malformed star imagery, um, looking at Estelle, seems like it has to do with like the fate of our stories, the fate of our storytelling um, in the stars as an omen. And that's something that the Chaldean astrologers studied quite a bit was the omen of the stars. And the fact that Estelle is referred to as a star of ill omen is also present in Chalde Chaldean astrology. A star of ill omen is typically caused by divine forces being upset. Oftentimes, kings would have to be sacrificed um, in order to appease the outer gods. However, during an eclipse, it blocked out the visibility the gods had on us, and these celestial events would allow others to take the place of their kings, or you could use like an animal or have like a symbolic sacrifice to represent your sacrifice as king to appease the outer god. And this is super cool because this little reference is actually hinted at with Mikola's walking mausoleums. It seems like this eclipse has the same sort of meaning of, um, you know, soul transference or kind of like replicating souls or duping or kind of like finding a... a What's the word? Like a shortcut or a, um, what's the word? Oh my God. Like a loophole. There we go. It's like finding a loophole in order to save somebody's soul, which is a really cool little, cool little historical nod. Um, so stars control fate. Let me backtrack really quick. What happened to the Chaldean astrologers though in history? They relocated to Rome actually. Um, and they were also followed by other people within Mesopotamia that came from the east. Worshippers of Jupiter or Sabazios were in Anatolia, and that is also known as the Cult of the Three Fingers. Here's an image of it. Um, and then they were also accompanied by Jewish people, and they practiced the Sabbath, obviously. There was a Roman praetor named Cornelius, and he fucking hated people from Mesopotamia. A lot of Romans really didn't like people with other belief systems, whether they were pagan belief systems, um, but anything that allowed citizens to circumvent divine law. So say if there was the Roman pantheon and there was a bunch of different gods, it was very common for emperors to assert themselves within the pa pantheon. So everybody wrote their own little like original character OC and they like put it in the pantheon of gods and uh, anything that I say as emperor means that it's divine law and you have to do it or else. And that was kind of the attitude at the time. But uh, there were all these Chaldean astrologers and people from Mesopotamia that had this really cool new scientific fad, pseudoscientific fad. But at the time, it was very new and fresh. It was very hip. It was very, like, uh, fresh. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but... They were saying, like, okay, well, like, the stars actually dictate a bunch of stuff. They dictate time. They dictate the passing of days. They dictate our fates. Like, they can, you know, we can tell if somebody has, like, an omen. We can figure out what's going to happen in your future. And uh, Cornelius hated this. <laughs> he hated this idea of the astrologers having some sort of divine insight. And he decided he wanted to kick out a lot of people from Mesopotamia and so in like one big fell swoop, he decided to kick out the cult of Sabazios, the Three Fingers, the Jewish people, because they engaged in the Sabbath. And um, 
the Chaldean astrologers. So the cult of the three fingers um, is, is super interesting because it's the worship of the sky god uh, and also Jupiter. It gets conflated with Zeus a little bit, um, according to Greco Interpretatio. So we have this entity that kind of lines up with like our fell god fire giant entity that has like that north pole of Jupiter on it. It's really neat. It's pretty cool. So um, they get they get exiled from Rome and those who try to remain actually get executed. And uh, the dude, the praetor, Cornelius, said that they were liars or slanderers, which is really interesting because Shabriri, whose name comes from Jewish folklore and myth about like a demon, is declared a slanderer or a liar. And it kind of makes me wonder about the authenticity of his crimes, if he was actually speaking lies or if he was saying things that um, circumvented divine law that Queen Marika or the Golden Order or the Greater Will didn't like. So whether or not he was actually speaking lies is remains to be seen, but in all honesty, I'm doubting it based on like real world history. The people were innocent and didn't do anything wrong. They just got wrongly uh, accused of divine crimes. So, um, as the study of the stars increased during the Enlightenment in parts of Europe, it couldn't be stopped. Like, even with the um, exile and the condemnation of Chaldean astrology, there were a ton of other people like Galileo and Isaac Newton and a lot of other early scientists popping up. Oh, hold on. And this caused a pretty big shift in spirituality because there were a lot of people who were kind of like learning about all this early science and they were wanting to embrace modernity. So changing their spiritual traditions to align with scientific findings, um, trying to understand things. So like even though uh, Isaac Newton was very much into like mysticism and a bunch of other stuff, uh, he also was still Christian, and there was like this flexibility and fluidity that a lot of people had with their faith. But there were a lot of people who considered themselves fundamentalists who wanted to remain true to scripture and to the fundamental aspects of the faith. And it's really cool because we see this um, occur in Elden Ring. We see this transition from, um, and this actually this happened in real life too. So a lot of pagan and nature worship was phased out. It was very difficult for the Catholic Church to phase these things out because oftentimes pagan deities and locations um, or physical locations and not just altars, you can't really destroy a physical location necessarily. So what they would do instead is they would build their churches on top of holy locations that were worshipped by pagans. And then um, a lot of the pagan deities were either referred to as daemons or they were incorporated into the faith in some way. So that way it was like you can... You couldn't not be, <laughs> you couldn't not be Catholic, and this is a process called assimilation, um, the process of absorbing other cultures into your own. But then over time, they get phased out in favor of the fundamentalist ideals of that scripture or religion. So we have uh, Godfrey's marriage with Queen Marika, and Godfrey is that Osgoth tribal group, and the worship of the tree slowly fades over time. And then we get more of like a Celtic, Germanic, Scandinavian knot. Um, and then we just get the fundamentalists of Golden Order when Radagon merges with Marika and starts his age. So there's like this very big shift between nature worship and the Erd Tree down to just the fundamentals of order and what order means to Radagon. It's quite interesting too because Radagon actually makes a point to go learn at the Academy of Raya Lucaria. He wants to go learn about the Enlightenment, and when he returns, he has all of these like fundamentalist ideas. So it's quite weird. It's quite shady because it conflicts with a lot of the stuff that Ronaldo was about. Um, but I talk about that in my Lyernia video a little bit. So Goldmask identifies as a fundamentalist at the beginning of the game, and his goal or purpose is to look into fundamentalism to understand the truth. And he does this through ascetic monk practices. And what that means is a lot of monks kind of like during this particular, during a particular time period in Rome would abstain from vain excesses like 
excess of food, excess of clothing, excess of material possessions in order to contemplate the teachings of God. Um, a lot of that had to do with how desire shaped um, things like greed and lust and um, sloth and like a bunch of other a bunch of other things that are considered as like sins or or kind of like bad. And there's also this questioning of like uh, how how a culture or sorry how religion is being injected in, into institutions and used as a justification to treat others with um, poor morals. Sorry, treat others with <laughs> treat others without kindness. I guess. Um, so. If we look at the uh, the teachings that Goldmask was looking into, he was looking at, like, if I'm a fundamentalist, I want to understand the fundamental teachings of order, like break it down into its, you know, most bare form. So he looks at causality, which um, causality is the pull between um, meaning, meanings that links all things in a chain of relation. So everything is connected. There's a chain of relation. Regression is the incantation of the golden order. Regression is the pull of meaning that all things yearn to eternally converge. So if we have a chain and there's this like yearning to converge, we have this order happening. We have this order. And it, it actually looks quite similar to the Chaldean order in terms of like it being you know, a series of interconnected planets and metals that all engage with each other. They all push and pull each other to hold each other in check. And this is quite funny too, because this happens in science as well. I was referring to the eye of um, the fire giants and the planet of Jupiter. This is actually how the cyclones are being held in place. It's through magnetism, it's through um, heating and cooling, it's through the pushing and pulling of all these different, um, you know, nuanced aspects of this structure that allows it to maintain its shape however if there's like a slight change it can cause the structure to fall it's not necessarily like a very it's a very delicate structure <laughs> um but that's what causality and regression are referring to um however all of a sudden the ramblings of gold mask get very strange when we get to order healing it stops being about like these philosophical concepts of chaos and order and connectivity and starts being about um, hunting those who live in death. And then Goldmask says how easy it is for the learning and the learnedness to be reduced to the ravings of fanatics. All the good and the great wanted in their foolishness was an absolute evil to contend with. Does such a notion exist in the fundamentals of order? And not really. If we're looking at order as like a philosophical concept, it's just a hierarchy, hierarchy or organization of information and, um, you know, in this case, planets. So it doesn't really exist in order. There isn't really like a bad guy. It's just all concepts, you know. So he kind of like points this out and he's in disagreement with this. And then there's also Litany of Proper Death, um, where it says the role of the hunters is to stamp out all defiled reason all for the perfection of the golden order. So this puts into question Queen Marika, the golden order, and kind of like this middleman between, um, you know, the Elden Beast or like what would be God and everybody that exists in between God and us. So if we're like the, the people who are supposed to receive the message and the messages from God, Queen Marika, um, the fingers, and pretty much everybody in between that's relaying this message might not be as authentic as we would like to believe. And this is what transcendental um, ascetic monks believed. They believed that the church and political institutions were actually causing a lot of um, corruption within faith. So um, that's kind of what, what a gold mask represents. It says humans that are inherently good, or sorry, humans are inherently good, society and its institutions as organized religion and politics are corrupting. Um, sorry, I read that weird. Blah, 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 blah. Humans are inherently good. Society and its institutions, such as organized religion and politics, are corrupting. Instead of being a part of them, humans should strive to be independent and self-reliant. Spirituality should not come from the self. Not organized religion. Insight and experience are more important than logic. Nature is beautiful. 
and should be deeply appreciated and shouldn't be altered by humans. Mm. And St. Francis actually had a disciple who became a saint as well, St. Juniper. And St. Juniper was so um, into aesthetic practices that he liked to give away his clothes when he would go out in public. If there was like a homeless person or somebody that was in dire straits and needed clothes, he would strip down completely naked and just give them everything that was on his back. And his disciples were always extremely embarrassed by this and would try to dress him. <laughs> and this is really similar to Gold Mask's storyline. If you check out his little loincloth and his bracelets, it talks about how they were made for him by his disciples and how Gold Mask had no draw of to the vein excess of clothing. He really didn't care about clothing. It was something that was kind of given to him by his disciples initially but it seemed like his disciples all abandoned him in the very end and didn't really agree with his teachings i initially thought that maybe he was poisoned in this scene because like there's this there's this weird little flask of fallen stuff but it seems like there's all these little words etched in the sigil but it's weird because they kind of stop somebody was suggesting that maybe he was painting and that he just simply passed out, which would make sense too. It's very like common for ascetic monks to starve to death or to just pass out if they're compelled by, you know, uh, their meditations and stuff like that. I was talking to a spy a while back about the Buddhist monks that engage in um, mummification during uh, during meditation. So there's a lot of really interesting practices regarding monks. However, I do think there is like a delineation between Buddhist monks and monks in Rome because monks in Rome were seeking to understand scripture, whereas Buddhist monks are often meditating on letting go of the illusion of life. And it's less about um, like this philosophy regarding all the different spiritual movements that occur within the Golden Order. Um, but I do think that they share a lot of the same values in that they wish to live ethically, they wish to not cause, cause others suffering, they are challenging their desires because desire leads to suffering um, and sin uh, in, in Catholicism in the ascetic monk practices were, were kind of in line with some, some of the Buddhist values. So there, there are some things that overlap. Um, but the common issue that seems to like have caused this whole thing from happening <laughs> or to happen is with scripture and language and changing written law and how written law often doesn't change with our sciences as technology advances. So both Martin and Miyazaki allude to this. The first time I noticed um, this reference of language was when the ancestral followers are engaging uh, in worship around the Sumerian obelisks down in the internal cities. They're also known as the Palace of Ul. They're singing songs and they're engaging in ritual sacrifice. They're um, trying to get horns to bud and grow into ancestral spirits, which eventually grow leaves on the end of their horns, similar to trees. And those ancestral spirits absorb the spirits of smaller animals around them. Um, they use a death rite bird staff and it's emulating the shape of the death right bird wings. It's colored purple, like purple ghost flame. And their ash mentions that they avoid written language and metalworking, and it seems that they share all of their spirituality through um, song and through practice instead of through written law. So um, when George R. R. Martin was referring to that, like, 5,000-year period of history that he wrote for Elden Ring... Um, that actually made me laugh because we talked about this before. Um, we talked about, you know, when Elden Ring takes place, it roughly takes place around the contemporary age with the reference of the Boshin uh, civil war in Japan and a lot of the isolationist policies. We also have a couple of paintings that are from the Boshin era that uh, are present in the game. So that lands us around the 18 to 1900s. And... Um, so that puts us in the contemporary age. If we go 5,000 years in the past and we end up in the ancient era, this is around the invention of writing and the invention of like scripture and like written language, written law, um, written, written theology. So if somebody is manipulating scripture or changing it over time to reflect maybe their political beliefs or their divine law, um, if somebody is you know, refusing to change it to align with new findings of science and nature, there arises a lot of problems. 
and a lot of confliction of belief and a lot of different philosophies that pop up and the ways that people like engage with that spirituality. So why is this important into understanding the ring like at all? Um, if we look at cultural inspiration for the characters and for the home of Marika, which is in Landal, we can kind of understand the like early um, history of that location. She's in Rome. She's married to someone who's from that Osgoth tribe because of his imagery incorporating the visuals of like Celtic, Scandinavian, and German faith. The Osgoth tribe settled in West Rome and um, Godfrey took over uh, creating the Crucible Era, which was like the tree worship, which we talked about with like pagan belief being transitioned out. When Marika becomes the patron deity of the Erd Tree, giving blessings to people. She was giving people like sap. Um, the Erd Tree talisman talks about how she used to deliver the sap herself to all of her followers. And it seemed to be this like idea of abundance and life. And it's quite interesting too, because um, if you combine the runes of death and life, it creates a rune that is used to refer to Freya, the Nordic god of gold and abundance and uh, childbirth. So it definitely lines up with this like Erd tree talisman of her trying to be her own source of, uh, you know, life and death. Um, the practice of Erd tree burials takes over death right bird um, burnings, and it seems like the Glomide Queen is nowhere to be found. So around the time, like at the beginning of the Erd tree era, it talks about how the Age of Plenty came swiftly to a close and the leaves began to fall. This took place really early on if we look at early or tree incantations. It closes out with the phrase, such is the course of all life. And Queen Marika didn't seem content with this. Um, she sends Malekith to Feramazula to seal away the patron deity of death, the Glomide Queen. This entity was defeated by Malekith and death no longer applied to the gods. Their age could be everlasting, and Marika alludes to this. I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order. Through the understanding of the proper way, our faith, our grace is increased. Those blissful early days of blind belief are long past. My comrades, why must ye falter? It's likely that this shift occurred after Godfrey and Marika married, as the change of the ring's design um, shows that things are no longer in balance with each other. If Marika's sigil was the upright crucifix of life and the great rune of death is this like downward crucifix, then these are the marriage of opposites. This would be, you know, the double helix, the fire of life and death. The, uh, this would be likely the twin birds that are being referenced, um, the body and the soul. So, well, let's see. Where were we? So we see this shift away from four equidistant runes at the center. We don't see the double helix anymore. And it seems like all things are held together by this anchor rune, which becomes the divine golden lineage that Godfrey has. And he passes it down eventually to Godric. It should have been given to Godwin. It could have possibly been given to Godwin uh, during the dragon, the age of the, the dragon rerouting and stuff like that. But, you know, there's a lot that's going on. So... The Glomide Queen was her twin mirror sigil, and they also together create the sigil for gravity, which is the pull between two things with mass, but they also create the sigil for magnetic fields in the game of Elden Ring, um, which is the pull between opposites. But we're looping kind of like around in circles with the symbolism, but it's also kind of why I love this game, because there's so much here with mythology and spirituality and metalworking and mysticism and it all kind of wraps in on itself very beautifully. It's like a very delicate, complex tapestry of interweaving concepts that all match up and play with each other really well and I, I love it quite a bit. Um, but let's look at Rome again and do like a quick recap of everything we just talked about. So fundamentalists struggled with sciences, early astronomy, and they declared a lot of those things heresy. Romans banished or executed anyone with differing ideals that threatened their spiritual or divine law that gave them authority to rule others. For example, Charlemagne and Constantine were the, the kind of like the big perpetrators of this, although a lot of other rulers engage in this practice. They all typically, like I mentioned before, burn down churches, destroy altars, build churches on top of holy grounds, or incorporate 
other deities or gods into their religion as what's called daemons, or beings that rule over um, the earth and the wind. So there's like anything that rules over the physical realm, anything that rules over nature is now a daemon. So the belief is that humans are inherently good, society and its institutions... Um, Oh, sorry, hold on, I skipped a, a step. So, ascetic monks in the East and West question the motives of the church creating um, transcendental spirituality, which focuses on independent approach from scripture and their institutions. They don't like violence and disengage from desire and will often give their own possessions away. The belief is that humans are inherently good. Society and its institutions as an organized religion and politics are corrupting. Instead of being part of them, humans should strive to be independent and self-reliant. Spirituality Comes, should come from the self, not an organized religion. Insight and experience are more important than logic. Nature is beautiful and should be deeply appreciated and shouldn't be altered by humans. If Ronnie's ending is about the removal of outer concepts into deep space beyond the veil so that way they don't have influence over our life, gold masks would be about keeping those concepts or outer influences intact, but rejecting the divine rule of um, conquest that Marika had and rejecting the acknowledgement of the two fingers and any intermediary that says that they know the will of God. And so that's what Gold Mask kind of stands for. So Gold Mask and Ronnie kind of have somewhat similar ideas, but quite different. And that's why I'm a Gold Mask stan. <laughs> but there's a lot of mysteries here, obviously, regarding the details of Queen Marika's past, and I'm totally uh, willing to admit that I'm wrong. Maybe the DLC will paint her as this extremely sympathetic figure, but as far as I see it, all I see is like her era creating a situation in which she's very afraid of death. She sealed death away. She is very scared of losing her tree and her era. She is trying to protect... Um, you know, the cycle of life and death that she created, but it's fundamentally flawed because she sealed away death into this cycle of the Erd tree. So it's kind of like she created her own problems, her own cycle of problems, <laughs> her own cycle of suffering. That's what Marika did. Um, but yeah, that's in general how I feel about the ring. I also feel that like all the stones, like all the different outer god um, jewels and stones, they obviously buff magic or like imbue certain um, certain spells and like incantations with like extra power. So it's pretty cool to see that like there are these like souls or soul force in in the in the order in the order of of outer gods. But yeah, love to see it. Love all the imagery. Love it all. It's great. Um, and that was my TED Talk. Thank you all for watching and thank you all for sitting through two of these videos because I had to correct myself about fundamentalism and transcendental ideology. I think I accidentally said that Gold Mask was a fundamental... Well, I mean, he is a fundamentalist at first, but that like fundamentalism is the separation between um, political systems and... and uh, institutions but that's not that's not right it's transcendental ideology blah blah okay all right i hope this was helpful and cool and fun bye